Welcome to the Intelligence Briefing Live, What's the Buzz? Where leaders and hands-on experts share how they have turned hype into outcome. Today, we'll talk about being all in with generative AI. And who better to talk to about it than someone who's actually just published a book on that, Tom Davenport. Hey, Tom, thanks for joining. Happy to be here, Andreas. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Hey, I'm sure the majority of our audience today already knows who you are. Um, you've been doing this for, for quite some time, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you've been up to lately before we get into our session today? Sure. So I'm an academic. I, I guess you, you might call me a pracademic. I sort of um, try to be um, applied to um, businesses and the work that I do. Um, I go back and forth between business schools and consulting firms, but I've been uh, a professor at Babson College, which is a business school in the Boston area for, I don't know, almost 20 years now, but a uh, consultant um, running research centers for places like Accenture and McKinsey and um, EY. And I write about how people and organizations use information and technology. So initially focused on business process reengineering, wrote a book on um, ERP at one point, uh, knowledge management for quite a while. And for the last, I don't know, 20 years, um, analytics, big data, and AI, which are all you know part of the same family. Awesome. Um, I, I must say, I'm, I'm having a bit of a fanboy moment here. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're talking about this in, in, in our prep. Uh, I, I came across your work uh, back in, in 2016, 17. I, I remember you writing about future of work and how automation and AI will shape that. So, you know, it sounds a bit geeky, but especially on, on March 14th, Pi Day, like I said, <laughs> having, a, having a bit of a fanboy moment here um, for our special episode. Yeah, I should have brought a slice of cherry pie or something myself, yeah. but sorry, yeah. I forgot. Uh, um, um, always after after the, the episode is enough time, right? So, hey, folks in, in the audience, if you're just joining the stream, drop a comment in the chat. What um, what do you recently use generative AI for? I think with all the tools that are available, whether it's for text or audio, video, images, there's so many opportunities these days. So I'm curious to, to hear um, what you've been using it for. And you um, should reveal that I'm not actually on this session. I'm a deep fake. So. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, right? Uh, it's almost like Schrodinger's cat. Um, so, but Tom, should we play a little game and kick things off? What do you think? Sure. Um, perfect. So this game is called In Your Own Words. Um, when I hit the buzzer, the wheels will start spinning. And when they stop, you'll see a sentence. I'd like you to answer with the first thing that comes to mind and why, in your own words. And to make it even a little more interesting, you'll only have 60 seconds for your answer. <laughs> so, and for those of you watching, um, drop your answer in the chat as well, and why. So, Tom, are you ready for What's the Buzz? Uh, I'm nervous. Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, excellent. Then let's get started here. If AI were a movie genre, what would it be? 60 seconds on the clock, go. So do I have to wait until the 60 seconds are up to no. say what I think? No, you're, you're good to go right away. Um, I think it would be a combination of a um, warm-hearted love story with a few horror elements thrown in. So um, uh, we don't know exactly how the AI story is going to end. There are a lot of people concerned that it might have some scary um, elements. And um, I recently sh saw this movie, Megan, um, about a very smart robot who ends up doing all sorts of dastardly things. And um, I thought, well, we're not that far from that really in terms of what capabilities AI has. So um, it is certainly quite possible that it would be a combination of, of outcomes. Awesome, fantastic. Thanks for that, that answer on the spot. So definitely a, a bit of sci-fi in there. That's good. It seems like it resonates with the audience as well. And, 
all uh, all different things from horror, comedy, action, and thriller. Um, I robot some some good examples. It's awesome. So now with the icebreaker out of the way, why don't we jump in into our questions? Um, like I said, and like you mentioned, you've you've just pu uh, published a, a book called All In on on AI, and I wanted to to take that as as the first question that has at least been on, on my mind, and I'm sure on, on the audience as, as well as, as they read the the title of today's episode. What does it mean to be all in on AI? What did you find out um, from those interviews that you've done? Well, you know, Andreas, if you were to drive from your home in Pennsylvania down to Atlantic City, you go all in, you put all your chips on the table, you make a big bet um, on a um, particular gambling outcome. And so going all in on AI is making a big bet on AI in your business, um, not using it on the margins, not using it to um, kind of tinker with um, a few business processes or run a few proofs of concept, but really, you know, dedicate yourself to some important production deployments and um, to change something important about your business, your business model, your strategy, um, key processes end to end, um, even changing customer behavior, I think in a substantial way is possible with AI. So in this book, which I wrote with Nitin Mittal of Deloitte, um, we talk about companies that have already gone all in um, to greater or lesser degree anyway, and um, have um, addressed something important about their businesses. And these were companies from all around the world, from Asia, Europe, United States, Canada, et cetera. Um, so if, if you're not thinking about that, you have a fairly substantial chance of, I think, falling behind some of your competitors. I think that's an excellent point that it, it takes that kind of conviction um, and, and, and support throughout that this is really a, a priority, something you really want to make happen and, and not just something that happens in a dark corner somewhere, right? What do you see these these companies do differently compared to those that just play around with it or, or that don't get it in, into a, a scalable um, outcome or a scalable infrastructure? Well, um, I think to me, the most interesting thing is actually changing your business model or enabling a new business model. So we talked about companies like Ping An in China, Airbus in Europe, um, um, Sampo in Japan, a big insurance company there that are really using AI to enable new um, business ecosystems. Ping An has five of them. All of them are powered by AI. One, the healthcare ecosystem is powered by a system called Good Doctor. It's an intelligent telemedicine system. Sadly, in the United States, we thought we were being advanced by letting you actually talk to your doctor over Zoom during COVID. But Good Doctor um, lets you use AI um, to triage um, whether you need to see a doctor or not, to, to suggest a diagnosis to the doctor and to suggest a treatment strategy. And um, 400 million people in China and Southeast Asia are using good doctor. So well over the number of people total in the United States. So um, that's definitely all in on AI in healthcare. Um, in uh, Airbus, they are using AI to power a, an ecosystem of all the airlines around the world that um, buy and use Airbus commercial aircraft. They also have on their um, uh, defense side, they have a satellite imagery business that um, they formed another ecosystem with. So I think, you know, we saw in uh, these platform oriented companies that are digital natives, Uber and Airbnb and, and so on, um, the connections of buyers and sellers through platforms, and you're seeing this in large organizations as well. But you can also change your products and services, your strategy. Um, uh, I wrote an article recently with a um, Oxford professor and a um, head, the head of AI at Shell 
about how AI is bringing back process re-engineering, which was you know, my first research focus in business. I wrote the first article in the first book on business process re-engineering um, back um, in the early 1990s. And um, Shell is totally changing how it does processes like maintenance and exploration and um, how it enables moving toward a um, less carbon oriented um, business model with AI. So um, these are all companies doing something substantial. Some are in process, some like Ping An have already seen fantastic results. It's the largest private sector company in China and the 16th largest company in the world in terms of revenues founded in 1988. So that tells you something about how rapidly they've, they've grown. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing. I think those are um, actually three ex excellent examples of, of where AI can um, demonstrate a measurable business value. One of the questions that I see in, in the chat here is, is from Michael. And by the way, if, if uh, rest of the audience, if you have questions, please do feel free to put them in the chat and we'll select the few that we'll go through in, in the next couple of minutes. But Michael is asking, is the, the hype over AI just the hype over blockchain? Like a solution looking for a problem. And I think that's an excellent question because in, in my perception, say before the end of November last year, media and analysts were almost talking up the next AI winter. I mean, is, is, is there really going to be sustained investment? Is this going anywhere? Are, are we just um, you know, uh, flattening out here? And, and then now with generative AI, certainly that's hit the turbo and, and the booster. So are we still just looking for a problem? for the, the technology that we have, what do you think? Well, uh, you know, we can look at companies that have already um, gotten considerable business advantage out of AI, like some of the ones I was mentioning, which was never really the case with blockchain. I think the only industry that prospered with blockchain was um, the um, cryptocurrency industry. And I, I must say, I was always a little suspicious if this is such a great and safe way to store information, then why are there so many frauds um, and hacks in that particular industry? So, um, you know, AI is always rated ahead of any other technology in surveys of business people for, you know, what is the most transformative technology that we're looking at now? Blockchain has dropped considerably, but AI hasn't really dropped over the past year or so. And as you suggest, Andreas, because of generative AI, I think it's even gone up. And you know, we have still lots of companies working to make AI better, um, large vendors, small vendors. Um, the amount of venture capital flowing into AI has dropped as it has to any um, in any other um, technology um, domain, but I don't think there's much doubt that um, AI is is here to stay. Fantastic! Thanks for for sharing. I think that's that's very very good and and, and very concise. Uh, also, where we believe things will be headed in in the future. Now, coming back to the the topic of of being all in. So you you shared examples from Penan, from Airbus, from Shell. What are the kinds of business outcomes that leaders and businesses can expect when they are all in, when they do go all in? What have you seen there? Well, in um, some of these um, ecosystem, AI-powered ecosystem business models, um, as um, one of the people we um, interviewed at Ping An said, it creates sort of a Disneyland of data in the sense that every participant in these ecosystems supplies data to um, the um, central organization in the ecosystem. Um, they um, all benefit from having access to that data, but the central organization uses it to create new products and services that are even more valuable, that enable more participants in the ecosystem. So you have this, um, this virtuous circle that enables much faster growth and better profitability over time. Um, in the... Um, Organizations we looked at that are doing operational transformation. I know, you know, Shell is um, uh, inspecting its pipelines and its refineries and used to be um, years that it would take to get through an entire refinery and inspect all the piping and the valves and so on. 
Now they use drones and um, deep learning based image recognition models to see, you know, does this pipe look fine or is there a potential problem there that we need to have a human go out and look at? And it's gone down to a matter of days for an entire refinery. So huge savings in um, terms of operations. Um, I think the an interesting model is the one that we have seen in a negative way in um, social media companies. It's changing the behavior of customers. And in social media, obviously, that hasn't worked out terribly well. And I think, you know, it's responsible for a lot of the um, polarization that we're experiencing in our society now. Teenage um, Teenagers are getting depressed, et cetera. I'm not saying that was intentional, but that was um, a, a behavior change outcome. But a number of companies, mostly insurance companies, are trying to change health behaviors to be more positive. Um, uh, companies like Progressive are using metrics not just to charge you more if you're an unsafe driver, but actually to tell you um, when you're driving in an unsafe fashion and to try to discourage you from doing so. So I think changing customer behavior is a is a third possible outcome, but not one that is as well developed outside of social media. Um, and as I say, the, the goal is very different is to create healthier people, better drivers, et cetera. I think that's an that's an especially interesting point. And also when when it comes to like a moral ethics uh, type of discussion, to, to what extent is it nudging for for the person's own benefit or to what extent is it optimizing the uh, the, the reward function or the optimization function of the model or of, of the company that employs ai i think there's there's a fine balance right yeah that's a good point i mean um in uh, health insurance for example if your customers get healthier that typically helps your bottom line as well so um, there's a pretty good um, alignment of incentives there. But as you suggest, there could certainly be cases, and I think we've seen that in social media, where what helps the um, company is not something that necessarily right. benefits the user at all. Very true. Maybe to, to pick one more question from um, from the chat, and I'll, I'll paraphrase this, but um, my, my interpretation of what Maya was asking earlier was, if you are digital native, cloud native, compared to a larger organization, incumbent traditional organization, what's the what's the effort right, um, to go all in with AI, to implement AI? Is, is the effort higher to do the change management than to, to build the AI and, and the models itself, if you've seen anything there? Um, well, I think in digital native companies, there is much less culture change needed. Um, uh, I have a friend who works for Meta at, in the analytics and AI space, and he's been a chief data and analytics officer at various legacy companies. And he said, you know, the big difference between this, his current job and the previous ones is he doesn't spend all of his time persuading people about the importance of, of data and analytics and AI. Um, uh, the reason why we focus really on legacy companies is it is a huge organizational change for them. They have an established business, a strategy, a culture, etc. And so changing in the direction of being all in or AI first or AI fueled, whatever you want to call it, is a dramatic organizational change. Um, I, I asked one of the uh, people I interviewed at a large um, retailer why he keeps taking these jobs in legacy companies as the you know head of um, analytics and AI. And he said, oh, you know, in those digital native companies, it's too easy. There's no <laughs> challenge there. Now, I'm not sure that's true. It's still challenging, certainly, but um, less so. And you know, we hope that these legacy companies will take some of these ideas and use them to, to transform their own businesses. I think that's that's great. And uh, looking at something like generative AI, I, I feel we're really just just starting to, uh, to scratch the surface with all the opportunities and, and possibilities that are upon us and, and before us. And, and maybe even to some extent making it easier to communicate, to understand, to 
also get some first-hand experience with AI. I feel it's it's getting a lot easier these days to to get some kind of output where you know, yes, there there has been AI behind it. How how do you see this evolving and and especially again with the theme of being all in? What does it mean being all in now with generative AI to take that one step further? Well, I think now it means um, large scale experimentation, both in um, corporate sponsored activities, but also encouraging individual knowledge and creative workers to explore um, generative AI. Um, you know, picking some tools that people might uh, explore and uh, funding any costs that they incur. Um, we still have a number of, of um, problematic issues with generative AI, of course, the hallucinations that um, occur, the legal issues involved in, you know, who actually owns the images that are used to train them. Um, I think there are even um, uh, issues around uh, all of the carbon that we burn up in generating these models. They're, they're just um, fantastically large and very expensive in terms of both dollars and energy to create. But I also think there's a massive amount of potential value there. And ultimately, I think if you are a knowledge or creative worker and you're not using these tools, you will be at a substantial disadvantage to people who are. Um, I, I mentioned earlier uh, my work in knowledge management uh, 20 or 25 years ago, and um, I think this has fantastic potential to make available all the knowledge that's been locked up within organizations. Um, later today, I'm going to try to watch, um, I've written in the past um, some of things about Morgan Stanley's use of generative AI to try to capture all of its knowledge and make it easily available to financial advisors. It's going to be described on CNBC in an hour or two. And um, I think that's one of the great potential um, advantages for large organizations to be addressing, even though you know, it's still tricky you're, you're going to have to do a lot of fine-tuned training, and you may end up with multiple levels of generative models. I was talking to someone in the legal industry um, last week who said, well, yeah, there's a overall large language model like GPT-3 or whatever, and then there is a legal version of it that some companies have already created. But then you also need a UK version and a US version, and maybe you need one for real estate law in particular, maybe you need one for a particular firm. So I think we're going to end up with multiple different layers of these models with increasing, you know, detail about the, the content that's in them. And it's not going to be easy to do, but I think it's going to be potentially quite valuable for companies to explore that. That's awesome, Tom. Thanks for, for sharing and, and for summarizing that. I think we're really just at, at the beginning and there's there's so much more to to learn and, and to explore as we're making progress in, in the industry. Now, I was wondering if you could summarize the, the three key takeaways for our audience today as we're getting close to the end of the show. Sure. Well, um, going all, all in on AI means making a substantial commitment in terms of money and people and um, uh, intellectual horsepower. How are we going to use this technology to change our business? Um, there are substantial outcomes that companies have achieved, either in enabling new strategies and business models or um, uh, drastically um, improved products and services. Morgan Stanley is one that's done that with a next best action system um, or um, uh, changing customer behavior as well, in addition to operational transformation. Um, and then um, generative AI is in its early days, but I, certainly it's exciting enough so that companies need to devote considerable attention to exploring it, to trying it out. To, um, and the most important thing I suggested was think about how can we manage all the vast knowledge we have within an organization to create you know, customers and um, uh, employees who are armed with everything the, the company knows. 
Fantastic. Thank you for, for that summary. Um, and thank you for, for joining us today, Tom. Like I said, it's it's been it's been a pleasure. I'm, I'm so excited we've been able to, to make this work. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise with us and for learning with us. Thanks. I enjoyed it, Andreas. So I'm going back to celebrating Pi Day. Um, <laughs> maybe you can have some of that cherry pie as well. And for the rest of you in the audience, thank you so much for joining. See you next time for another round of the Intelligence Briefing Live. What's the buzz? Bye-bye.